Okay, well, it, it is truly for me an honor to introduce our next guest. Um, his bio is in the program, and I hope you take a, the opportunity to view and understand his incredible career and accomplishments. But for the students, I want to point out that he's a distinguished graduate of the Naval War College. He graduated in 1985, nearly 40 years ago, not to highlight the 40. Um, but since graduation, this is what I want to point out is that he's completed his 20 year, 21 year career in the Army, earned a PhD from Harvard. He served on the personal staff of three secretaries of defense, served Andy Marshall in the Office of Net Assessment, founded the Center of Strategic and Budgetary Assessment, which is, has become one of the prominent think tanks in Washington, served on numerous boards and advisory panels, including uh, chairman of the CNO Executive Panel. He's written numerous books, but I'll point to the two most recent, and that is The Last Warrior, Andrew Marshall, and Shaping of Modern Defense Strategy, and his most recent, The Origins of Victory, How Disruptive Military Innovation Determines the Fates and Great Powers. So if you're sitting there as a student wondering if you're midway through your, 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 your book, you're just on chapter two. Um, so again, please welcome Dr. Andy Krechtovich. Yeah, 40 years. <laughs> 40 years ago I showed up here. And, uh, and the years have not been kind to me, I guess. <laughs> At least that's what my wife tells me. Um, Anyway, uh, it's, it's certainly a pleasure to come back here. Um, over the years, the, uh, the auditorium here has been renovated uh, quite a number of times. Uh, back in my day, it, it also went by the name the Blue Bedroom. I don't know if that uh, resonates with any of you. It was a lot bluer, and uh, it served a, a purpose uh, not always intended by the, uh, by the administration here. Uh, I've got the sexy topic of operational concepts uh, to discuss with you today, so we'll, we'll see if the, the bedroom moniker uh, holds true or not. But uh, this, this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about. It's, it's the overview. It's the, uh, the road map. But it's kind of going to be like a, a, a sip of water for, through a fire hose or uh, you know, just sort of the tip of the iceberg. But I thought, given what you've been through this past year, and what you're going off to in terms of the environment that was just superbly and depressingly described to you by our, our previous uh, speakers, that uh, this is an, akin to a homework assignment for you, uh, strategy and operational concepts. And uh, by way of a little bit of background, of course, 40 years ago, uh, we were in the midst of a Cold War. Uh, we were in the midst of the Reagan defense buildup, uh, something that we probably need today, but as has been noted, uh, probably nowhere uh, in sight. Uh, we were in a much stronger position then than we are today. And still there was this sense of the need for people who could think strategically, a high priority on that, and people who understood the operational art of war. And I was part of a small army contingent, uh, about half a dozen of us. And we were in the junior program. And uh, the army, uh, I think, thought it was sending its best and brightest. And I, I think to a certain extent it was, because one of my colleagues uh, went on a couple of years after graduating to become the military assistant to the vice president of the United States. Another one went on to command in Iraq ended up being Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. Another was sent from West Point, he was head of an academic department, to come here. And in fact, while he was here, they asked him to teach an elective. Uh, so he taught the elective, uh, I guess that was his extra duty, and then went back to the academy to run that department. And then there was me. And I uh, graduated in uh, 85, and eight years later retired as a lieutenant colonel. So the Army's accuracy was not quite 100% when it came to the best and the brightest coming to the Naval War College. Uh, but there was one thing I did get to do between graduating and, and retiring. And uh, a year after I graduated, I was assigned to be the military assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Special Projects. And in that job, I basically got to 
uh, organize and assemble with the senior department leadership's guidance, something called the Annual Report to Congress or the Posture Statement. It was about this thick. It formed the basis for the Defense Secretary's testimony at the beginning of the new Congress. And it was a great opportunity for me to see how strategic planning and the links between strategic planning and operational concepts were done back in the Cold War. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that today uh, and try and link it to some of the challenges that were described by your previous speakers. So that's, uh, that's basically that. Um, Secretary Del Toro is looking for admirals who can think strategically. Well, why wouldn't he be? Uh, when I was doing the posture statement, the fleet was approaching 500, uh, actually was approaching 588 ships, combatants, that would be the max. The Army was 781,000 troops, uh, and you can go right on down the line. Uh, after the Cold War, the Navy was set at 346 combatants to deal with the likes of Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Uh, the Army was downsized to 490,000 troops. And of course today, many, many years later, we've got much bigger problems, and the Navy wishes it could get the 346 ships, and the Army will not see 490,000 troops anytime soon. So what a, what a better time for strategic thinkers when the challenges and the threats are growing and when the capabilities are diminishing and when budgets, quite frankly, are either flat or declining in terms of inflation. So absolutely, as Secretary Del Toro says, time for strategic thinking. Uh, there's another guy, uh, you may have heard about him, uh, particularly with the D-Day anniversary. Uh, he valued strategic thinkers. In fact, he headed war plans before going out, uh, out to uh, command in the European theater in World War II. And he said, basically, strategy is a game anybody can play. But to play it at sort of the chess grandmaster level, that's very hard. And we need good strategy. So coming up with a good strategy, I need the very best staff officers I can, the very best educated. And they're going to be doing the hardest kind of work. And the work now, I would say to you, is harder now than at any time in my professional career. You have your work cut out for you, okay? Now we get to the issue of operational concepts. Well, to have an operational concept, you need an operational challenge. You know, what the, uh, it was mentioned that I used to work for Andy Marshall once upon a time, and one of Marshall's first questions in strategic planning is what are we trying to do? And of course, during the Cold War, and I'm going to refer back to the Cold War, that seemed to be the preeminent operational challenge. And contemporary, I would argue, the challenge on the right is our principal challenge. I think we can endure setbacks in just about any other part of the world and recover, but not in the Western Pacific. And so for me, that operational challenge is every bit as important, if not more important, than the operational challenge in terms of priority that we faced in the Cold War in Europe. Okay, compelling real world problems. Okay, what is the real world problem at the operational campaign level of war? Now I'm gonna assume something. There's a lot of different strategic options you could choose. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. You could develop an ability to execute more than one strategy, more than one defense strategy. But I'm going to focus on the one that at least it seems to me, having worked on this issue with respect to Asia for the last 15 years, that we're gravitating towards. And that's kind of a forward defense posture, forward defense strategy. And the way I've been trying to tackle it through an operational concept is called archipelagic defense, referring to the first island chain. So again, not mutually exclusive, but you've got to set priorities, particularly in the environment in which you're operating now. Uh, why are they important? Uh, admiral Jackie Fisher, probably the most famous British admiral between Nelson and now, uh, was pretty blunt about it. Uh, and oh, by the way, that, that last line is, uh, was his. It's not mine. I didn't try and insert it being an old army guy. But you know, basically, 
once you have a strategy, you need to decide, as Fisher says, how you're going to fight. Well, how are we going to fight? How are we going to defend the first island chain? Operational concepts, this is the joint staff's definition. And basically, it's how you're going to conduct operations in a, in a theater of war to achieve your strategic objectives. And a lot of factors go into determining what the limits are and what you can do. Uh, and they're the, basically what Sir Michael Howard would call the, the dimensions of strategy, technological, logistical, social, uh, diplomatic, and of course, operational. Uh, you know, what, what are the limits, okay? But you also, in, once you come up with an operational concept, you're also informing how you think about mobilization, how you're thinking about where to be in terms of your basing, what kind of alliance relationships you need, and, and what are the priorities, what you're going to ask of your allies and what you expect your allies to ask of you. And of course, uh, always important, defense program priorities. What's going to be in the budget, what needs to be put in the budget that isn't there, and what needs to be taken out. The Cold War. When I was working the posture statement in the late 1980s, a couple of years before the Berlin Wall went down, uh, there was an approach that was sort of funneled into the, into the posture statement uh, that talked about everything from policy, strategy, and operational concepts all the way down to defense programs and all the major programs. Back then, we had a set of interlocking operational concepts, okay? Uh, this one reflects air land battle and something that was called FOFA, uh, which was follow on forces attack that was the, the operational concept or the doctrine that NATO adopted. And uh, I can't point to you on the slide here, but it was realized that we were outnumbered in terms of forces. So how are we going to make up for that disadvantage? And in the late 1970s, we realized that uh, and I'm not sure any of you are old enough to remember this stuff, but anyway, you could buy a, a pocket calculator. Uh, when I went to the military academy, we had something called slide rule drills. Uh, yeah, ha, ha, ha. Uh, try it. <laughs> try, try it sometime, you know? It's a whizzing back and forth. Um, anyway, uh, I remember I was at Fort Bliss and I went into the PX, and lo and behold, there was this thing called a pocket calculator. And I said, oh my God, you know, this thing will do what a slide rule will do. And I don't have to think, you know, really, uh, which was a big plus, you know, for me. And uh, so I buy it and I take it home and I said, this is, this, you know, for 30 bucks, you know, this is what you get, you know, throw the slide rule out. And uh, about six months later, I go back in the PX and they have better pocket calculators for less money. I was really ticked off. I was working on a captain's pay back then, and uh, that was not something I wanted to see. I always wished it was more expensive. But anyway, uh, to make a long story short, we had this enormous advantage over the, the Soviets at the time. There wasn't this integrated global economy, and we decided to push that advantage as fast and as far as we could. And of course, that's a big part of the strategies that you'll be developing. How do you identify those advantages with limited resources that you push as hard as you can? And a, a decent strategy will identify an advantage and push it. A better strategy will identify an advantage that can be aligned against an enemy weakness and applied that way. And really the best possible strategy, in my estimation, is to identify an enduring source of advantage and apply it against an enduring weakness of your adversary. Something that's very difficult for us to lose if we, if we mind ourselves and very difficult for our adversaries to get out from underneath. And that was when we started to work on something that the, the Russians called a reconnaissance strike complex. We would call it Precision warfare, maybe. You know, the components being precision strike, the battle network, the scouting forces, all integrated. And that was the, that was the, the trigger, the inspiration 
for General Rogers, the supreme allied commander in Europe behind air, land, battle, and follow-on forces attack. And the idea was the war would start and there would be these waves of reinforcements coming out of the Soviet Union. And we could handle maybe the first, you know, the frontline forces, but those waves crashing against us, uh, they were the ones that were going to overwhelm us. And the Army and the Air Force, there was a whole series of memoranda because the Air Force had its, its ways of thinking about fighting. There was about 18 or 20 one of them. They kept, the chiefs kept signing them. And it was, this is how we're going to divide this deep battlefield because the Army is no longer restricted to the front lines. The Army's going deep and so is the Air Force. And so that was the idea. You would break up these follow-on echelons, these reinforcement waves, and that's the way we would hold the front in Europe. And the Allies bought into it. They, they didn't have these kinds of capabilities. In fact, it wasn't until the first Gulf War, looking at the lessons learned, that the Soviets, uh, only, they only had a few months left uh, before they went into Chapter 11, but the Soviets said, this is the first time we've seen this fusion of scouting, battle network, and strike systems. This first time we've seen this reconnaissance strike complex. And we were living, we've been living off that advantage for quite a long time, but of course now there's one other country that can do it apparently quite well, and that's China. Okay, what about the maritime forces? There are actually 11 memoranda of understanding established between the Navy and the, uh, the Army and Air Force during this period, around 1984, so just as I was showing up. Um, and it, uh, you could look at it in terms of operational concepts coming out of the maritime strategy, the outer air battle, and the Marine Corps' maneuver warfare. And the, the Navy and the Marine Corps said, look, if that's the way you guys are going to fight, uh, we've got to do a couple of things to help you out. And what they decided upon was, and, and again, these are general terms, in, in terms of the maritime strategy, uh, part of that call for our attack submarines to move north of the Greenland, Iceland, UK gaps and basically keep Soviet submarines from getting into the Atlantic and going after our, our convoys, our reinforcements. Uh, but we had to worry about the bombers. There was this uh, Soviet bomber called the Backfire, and it was a ripoff of the B-1. We used to call it the B-1 ski. But anyway, <laughs> we had to do something to amuse ourselves. You know. uh, anyway, the, uh, the outer air battle was how the carrier force was going to keep those Soviet bombers from intruding into the Atlantic shipping lanes. And that's what they were going to do, big part of their effort. The Marine Corps had something called the maneuver warfare concept or doctrine. And they said, look, we're going to get into Norway and help our Norwegian allies hold those airfields so the Soviets can't seize them and base their aircraft forward. And in so doing, we're also going to protect the northern flank of the NATO forces in Europe, in, in, uh, in the Central Front area in Germany. And so they formed this interlocking set of operational concepts. And as I said, they were defined by certain understandings between the chiefs, and they were exercised like crazy. And they were perfected over time, and they formed the basis for executing our, our defense strategy uh, in Europe during the the last years of the Cold War. Now, I know we tend to focus a lot on Taiwan, and rightly so. Uh, during the Cold War, we focused on the Central Front in Europe, the inner German border. But there were a lot of different ways we knew that war could happen. It wasn't just, you know, Central Front, Central Front, and this is the way it's going to happen. Uh, we looked at different ways it could happen. It's not just going to be necessarily Taiwan if there is a war in the Western Pacific. And so these may not mean much to you, but the Hamburg grab, I don't know if you can see Hamburg up there, uh, not very far across the border. There was a fear that the Soviets would launch a, a surprise attack and basically just seize Hamburg and say, you yeah, know, we don't want this thing to go nuclear, let's sit down and negotiate. Well, they're negotiating, they have Hamburg. And what does that say to our allies about the ability of NATO to protect its members? You just lost one of the key cities in, in your major, in one of your major allied countries. So 
that was one. The other was the Austrian gambit. So Austria is down here for all you geographically challenged folks. And there was a, a bunch of Soviet forces down here in Hungary. And the assumption was, well, these guys are either going to Italy or they're going to Greece. All right, but somebody said, well, what if they, what if they decide, you know, to plow through the Austrian mountains and into, in, into southern Germany? That's, that's a whole bunch of forces. We got a plan for that. Uh, what if they outflank us? You know, we can't get, we can't ignore it. We can't ignore that that's what might happen. We might be confronted with a much larger adversary. There was the Iranian misdirect, and that was kind of the wrong war at the wrong place at the wrong time. What happened if the Soviets invaded Iran on their way to the Persian Gulf, and we, you know, turned on the tip fit, started flowing all these forces uh, into the Persian Gulf, and it was a misdirect. They, uh, they cared about the Persian Gulf, but they really cared about going to war in Europe. And so, having moved forces in one direction, how could we recover? And that was alluded to, I think, uh, to some extent, in modern terms, by David Sanger, who talked about you know, attacks that would basically slow us down in terms of getting to where we needed to be. And finally, the issue of protracted war. When I was uh, on the Defense Policy Board, we had a vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff who came in one time and said he could not imagine a, any contingency which we would be confronted that would last more than a few months. Well, that was a long time ago. And that's certainly not the case now, and we found it out in terms of our ability to produce, whether it's ships or large quantities of munitions. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that a war would be a short war. So there are a number of ways we had to look at, you know, well, if conducting these operations, would they all stand up under these varying kinds of contingencies? And for those of you uh, who know your history, and of course this place is, is full of it, uh, history that is, uh, just, just kidding, old, old student, yeah, a little bit of payback. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, the color plans and the rainbow plans between the, before the Second World War. I mean, we sliced and diced that, those problems you know, numerous times. And we need to do it again because, as was pointed out, it's not just China that we have to be concerned about. Uh, there seem to be folks lining up uh, wanting to uh, take a shot at infringing on our interest and those of our allies and partners. Now, I just want to do a little bit of a drill down because this is, I, is something I remember very well. There was an obsession about mobilization. Uh, I, you know, and we used to call this the, uh, the Coca-Cola chart. Uh, this is you know, the wave, the Coca-Cola wave. Anyway, this was the, the balance of forces uh, over time, so we could see how we were doing relative to the Russians, starting out in 1965, and this was when I was working at in 87. And, uh, what the ratio of forces would be. And we looked at it in terms of all kinds of variables. Range of possibility results from different assumptions concerning Soviet intentions, war planning, readiness, training cycles, mobilization capability, and other related factors. We even looked at, they would rotate their draftees in, and we would account for that in terms of how that would affect their ability to amp up their forces and get them into their war positions. Uh, we, there were three different mobilization contingencies beyond that. One was sort of the standing start, one was the, uh, the slow boil, the building up of the crisis, and the other one was Goldilocks. And the, the numbers refer to, we would figure out what was going on, we would have 21 days of warning, and the war would start on day 30. 10 days of warning, war start on day 14, two days of warning, day start, uh, war starts on day four. So it's M plus four, the war starts. And that was one of the, the, that analysis, that planning, was a major factor in our positioning four entire army divisions worth of equipment in Europe, four extra sets of equipment. It's called POMCAS, preposition overseas materiel configured to unit sets, okay? So there was this enormous effort, and I wonder, in fact, I've been, uh, my visits to the, what, what do we have like this today? Because this was not a secret. This was that chart and the chart with air power and so on. Those charts were all in the posture statement at the time. That was all public knowledge. 
are working on this, are thinking about it. What do we have for China? Okay, so right now, we're facing a very hard problem. It's harder than this one here, uh, although this person seems to have come up with the answer. Uh, we don't want to come up with the wrong answer. So the current, current concepts, what current concepts, you know, what's our current version of air land battle, outer air battle, maritime strategy? And these are the ones that, uh, that I come up with to deal with this, this problem. And my question has been, since I've been working on this with the military um, and the Pentagon for about 15 years now, is uh, how do you know when things are serious? Okay, well, there's, there's one obvious way you know things are serious when the budget starts to you know, really change, okay? Big things get dropped off. You also know because of the Marine, you know, you know when things are serious when there's a food fight going on. And right now, who's got the food fight? The Marines, right? I mean, all these retired generals calling each other names, you know, let's take it outside, you know, stuff like that. They, they're, they're not happy. Uh, but that's what happens when you're faced with a very big problem, much bigger in scale than we've had, in a different part of the world, fighting us or planning to fight us in a very different kind of way. Hard to believe that the, the program or record that we've had is just the right size for this very new and different problem. So that's why they're having a fight. If, if the other services were having that kind of fight, things would really be interesting. Uh, my most recent book, Every time you, you find a service engaged in disruptive innovation, there's a fight. Uh, you get a chance to ask Professor Kennedy, the fight was so bad in the Royal Navy in the first decade of the last century, they had to call six weeks, I think it was, of meetings of the Com uh, Committee of Imperial Defense, and the referee was the Prime Minister. That's how bad it got between, and that was within the Navy. That wasn't even cross-service. So that's one way you know that, that things are serious. Uh, I've been working the issue for, as I mentioned, a while now, mostly the term archipelagic defense. I like it because we're talking about defending an archipelago, and I can say archipelagic, and very other few people can. So <laughs> I figure I have a monopoly on the concept just because. And I've uh, just published a recent piece in uh, Foreign Affairs on uh, Long War with China. And uh, oddly enough, uh, you know, it wasn't me, uh, they came to me and said, hey, what about a long war with China? And I said, oh, maybe. Uh, and so there is this, um, this race, in a way, to come up with a better idea of how to deal with this particular problem, this operational challenge, uh, because right now, time is not working for us. Uh, this is a uh, sort of a rough slide that shows you yeah, I'm thinking back to the Cold War slides I showed you, you know, about you know, where the Air Force and the Navy, you know. This is my version of what it would look like. And the, the Japanese, quite frankly, are, uh, are doing a pretty good job. Um, and uh, indo pacom is starting to get in the game. Uh, I, I guess starting with Admiral uh, Harris uh, some years back, but also Admiral Aquilino and the, uh, the new commander. So we're moving in that direction. The question is, are we moving fast enough? And there's another issue here, and that is, I think there are two potential sources of advantage that we could develop. If strategy is about identifying and developing and exploiting advantages, I think there are two that don't necessarily relate to spending large gobs of money that, uh, that probably won't be there. Uh, so one is, is how to be less wrong, because we're now, according to my taxonomy, we're fighting in eight domains, okay, having added the seabed, space, and cyber since World War II. Before then, we were fighting in five. Uh, 200 years ago, we were fighting in two, and neither could really do much about what was going on in the other, land and the sea. And thanks to advances in range, speed, and accuracy, uh, we not only wage war in these eight domains, we wage war across these eight domains. So when the Chinese think about how do I blockade Taiwan, it's not getting, you know, a hundred old wooden frigates and running a circle around the island. They're drawing on capabilities from eight different domains and blending them together. That's a lot of great choices. The problem is it's a lot of great choices. 
and the odds are that you're going to pick just exactly the right mix is very, very low. So one big challenge for us is given these, given the operational challenge, given the contingencies, how do we try to make sure that we're less wrong than our adversaries? And this place kind of wrote the book on it back before World War II. There was talk about the, uh, the virtuous cycle. There was a virtuous cycle in terms of innovation that the Naval War College was a core piece of in the 1920s and 30s to make sure that we got it less wrong than most other navies uh, and we were competitive with the Japanese. The other is how to cure our case of the slows. That was a term President Lincoln used when referring to General McClellan who could never seem to bring the Confederates to battle. But, okay, so you, you, you find out, you, know, you try to be less wrong than your adversaries and then the balloon goes up and you can see, well, this is where we're wrong. Well, who can adapt more quickly? And again, our earlier speakers, if it's shipbuilding, you know, uh, it's not likely to be us. Um, can you change your tactics more quickly? There's a, a book called Execute Against Japan. It's the story of how we basically reworked our entire approach to submarine operations in the early days of World War II from screening for the fleet to actually going and waging a commerce raiding campaign. You know, big shifting of gears, we did it. Okay, so two areas where, and of course these two areas are areas where the War College, you know, can really come to the fore because a lot of it is up here. A lot of it is thinking through the problem. A lot, is, a lot of it is saying, how do we operate more efficiently? How do we operate more effectively? And that, that is worth a great deal. So my concluding thoughts, um, I think if you look at the scale of the challenge and the resources we have to work with, uh, this is as big a strategic challenge as any, uh, we, we don't have so many of the advantages we had in the 20th century. Uh, so strategy is gonna be at a premium. Really need strategists and people who know the operational art. How badly needed, I put that in there so I remember. Very badly, okay. And, where does a lot of this happen? Where do we, where do we, you know, where do we say, look, these are our best operators at the 04, 05, 06. Bring them here, and let's find out who the best strategists are too. And those are the people that the SecNav is looking for because he wants to make them admirals. So that that's the end of my remarks. I brought my little friend. Say hello. All right. Thank you, Andy. That was terrific.